follow-up discussion on senior and disabled tax relief. This is one of the issues that came out of the retreat that the uh, council asked that we provide a uh, presentation to you. Uh, also tonight, there are three selected agenda items that we'd like to discuss with you prior to uh, the formal, and that's the bus transfer station that we discussed the last time we were together, a light rail resolution, and then uh, there's a ordinance tonight related to tall weeds and grass and how we can be more efficient in addressing tall weeds and grass. So with that said, Mayor, thank you. With that said, Mayor, I'll turn it back to you. Okay. okay. Paul. I have a, and I know Stanley's here, and I will stay. Having Stanley still with us, he's somewhere here is significant. Uh, we are going to have, and being on the Hampton Roads Regional Jail, we are going to have a vote coming up that's going to affect us fiscally, financially. Um, and that vote is uh, at least a discussion on it will be November 2nd at 1230. It's a special meeting. I've been attending the meetings uh, the sheriff has and Stanley has. And I'm, Mark, she may have been briefed on this, but it deals with Portsmouth trying to redo their waterfront. They're going to want to move their jail facility or at least move their inmates uh, to the regional jail facility. That movement uh, will affect us financially, could affect us positively yeah, financially right. if we give up a certain number of beds. That being said, I need to let the council know that I got notice of the special meeting that I think is going to be the discussion session where we're going to hammer out how many beds we'd be willing to give up. Hampton is not willing to give up any and cannot give up any. Uh, I think Newport News is willing to give up some beds also. It could be a positive cash flow to us if we do that. Uh, that being said, uh, Anthony is my alternate uh, at this regional jail meeting. He should, and I am unavailable. Uh, getting the notice yesterday of the special meeting. And if Anthony, if you could check your availability of November 2nd, it's a Friday um, at 1230. It's significant that you should be there to cast a vote. I also think that perhaps we should meet whether it includes myself, the manager, Stanley, and um, the sheriff, uh, to perhaps at least get our ducks in a row before we go in. Stanley's always very kind to pull me aside, at least give me uh, his corporate knowledge and his version of what we need to do as a city, as the sheriff does. But I think this is something that we need to all be on the same sheet of music going into that November 2nd meeting uh, with an understanding that you know we could, uh, we need to have really the manager's input on this one. I know we get it through Stanley, don't get me wrong, but we all should have our votes lined up appropriately. I, I, I agree. There are financial implications. Yes, which are good ones for us. But there are also long-term issues, too. If you give up beds, there are. you may need them. We do have certain future. guaranteed bed space. We would give up the present space, but we still have our guarantee. Those are things we need to discuss, and I think that we need to get that. And Anthony, please check your availability for Friday, November 2nd at 1230. Uh, we should have my alternate there since I will be my plan is to be in Charleston that day or to be at least be leaving that afternoon for Charleston uh, and and maybe all of us get together at some point to discuss where we want the city to be in that uh, sure are they gonna make a decision that day there's it, I think that day is the hammer it out day yeah uh, and I think that there's the idea is we want to have at least some idea of where we can be um, uh, and not have to be running too much back. We, we do realize that we bring it back to council, but I think the idea is, is you know, where where do we want to be? And I think well, the issue is we pretty much want, do we want state in, inmates? Well, that that is an issue, and that's been discussed. It's not state inmates. They've kind of taken care of that. It really is the, the ICE inmates. inmates. It's the yeah. ICE inmates that there's 400 of them that are currently there. Portsmouth needs 400 spaces. The question is, is that, you know, if we give up a certain number of bed space and and, um, and uh, Newport News does, we can give that up because we don't need that per se right now. Our numbers are down right now. Right, and because our numbers are down, we don't give up our guarantee. But this is something we talk about offline. We can give up beds without giving up all our guarantee. Exactly, because we're still, right. we still have our guaranteed space. So the question is that I just want to make sure we don't get caught unprepared, and I also want to make sure that we have our vote there and that Anthony, since he is the alternate member, that if he can please check to make sure he's availability. Um, yeah, and if, you know, if I have to cancel my plans, I do. Uh, that was what I wanted to discuss. I have something when we ultimately vote on the uh, transfer station, I have prepared remarks, but that really is what I wanted to make sure uh, 
I did not want that to get by. Uh, I have I did attend the courthouse meeting uh, yesterday, and that seems to be going on schedule. With the uh, I understand that the steel will be completed end of December, January. Um, we do need to get um, uh, they need to get an arts committee together, uh, and if there is going to be any public art separate from the arts committee, uh, that needs to be discussed because uh, uh, we need to get that rolling. Um, and uh, I think that they've done a fine job in keeping us updated. We meet frequently on that and uh, seems to be on schedule. That's all I have we on have, we have a piece of public art in front of that, court, of that courthouse now. Yeah, he's talking about there's Seven also a budget for public art, you know, they, they came through the construction <coughs> budget, but also there is the, the portraits that we have. Right. We have okay. 20 some, 30 some portraits that need to be moved, uh, refurbishing some of those. In regards to the regional jail, I think it should be a, a, a decision that we make, you know, as a council. Uh, I was a former member of the regional jail for a long time, and we do have a moral obligation to our jail population is not to overcrowd them uh, to make a couple of dollars. And I'm sure that's not the thrust of it anyway, to make a couple of dollars. Uh, but there should be some other alternatives. But uh, when we before we make a decision, I'd like to see that come to the entire county <coughs> so we could, you know, have some input on it. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, I spoke to Rick earlier in the week. We made a, a faux pas in regards to the L.D. Britt scholarship dinner, I spoke with Dr. Britt, and he was, you know, sort of concerned that, you know, we didn't have any representation uh, at the scholarship dinner uh, from the city. Part of the problem had to do with um, a new procedure as far as billing is concerned. Since then, I think we have at least sent a contribution equivalent to a table. But uh, his major concern, meaning Dr. Britt, is that he does see representation from the city as he has in the past and so hopefully you know next year uh, things will be able to accommodate I wasn't able to go I went to Jim Holly's funeral uh, which was um, you know very well attended but uh, Dr. Britt is one of our fine citizens and he does a lot for the community so next time I think we need to do something about that uh, last week Mr. Burford made some very compassionate remarks about the murders that have taken place uh, within the boundaries of his ward, as well as other parts of the city. And we always pick up a newspaper if it's not in our city, it's either in Newport News or Portsmouth. And so it's, it's sort of a, an epidemic <coughs> that we're facing uh, nationwide. And um, we seem to have gotten sort of control of the gang-related violence, I believe. But somehow, we need to uh, find out, you know, what can be done. And, it, and it's nothing that, that, that we can just sit around in one evening or two evenings and find the answer to, because uh, the, the answer is, is systemic. And so we really need to find out uh, what we can do to kind of stem the tide of those two things, the murders in his particular neighborhood and, and within the city. Um, because it affects where a parent might decide to send their child to school. And uh, all of these things have a great impact on us as a city, so we need to uh, find the best minds that we can, can get to put around the table, whether it's from human services, the uh, police department, uh, whoever, you know, this, this council to try to uh, deal with it and maybe invite some of the other uh, council persons from other cities that are uh, having this problem, Newport News in particular, to see what the actual problem is. And I, you know, I, and even if you talk to these youngsters one on one, there's just so many things that um, that were not even prevalent that we came along with street creds and things that you know that these kids they just believe are important to them. Somehow we have to let them realize that life is more important than maybe a 15 minutes worth of friction with another individual. So, <clears throat> Burford brought it up last week. I think he was, you know, right on point with that. Uh, I don't know whether checking curfew, you know, being heavy on that again, whether that would be uh, part of it. You know, I, I don't know the answer. And maybe 
nobody around this table knows the answer, but I think we need to put our heads together and see what we can do to kind of protect our youngsters. So, that's all that I have. Oh, except for parking on Church Street for Square Deal Barbershop. Right. The doctor's going to be starting construction very soon, so we need to, you know, move forward with that. Two things. <clears throat> One, the, uh, when you go around the city, we've acquired quite a bit of property. And, you know, maintenance and upkeep of our city properties is truly important. Sometimes those properties have a blighting influence on communities. Um, you know, I, I was riding around the other day and uh, I noticed that we had properties and we didn't have signs up on those properties. No trans, no trespassing, uh, no parking. Uh, people tend to utilize city properties, drive on it, use pop trucks on them, uh, and unless we have somebody that's out and looking at that, uh, then it becomes a problem in certain areas. Uh, you know, and again, I was just you know riding through, and I knew that it was city property uh, that we owned, but. You know, an RHA property has a sign on their property. Normally, most some of their property has no trespass. <clears throat> some of it don't, but at least has a sign up there that you know that it's not for redevelopment housing authority's property. <clears throat> I think that is important <clears throat> as a city that we uh, don't do anything to contribute to the <clears throat> to the uh, blight within the community, but more importantly, that we should make a, a, a conscious effort to make sure that our house is in order. If we're going to give people citations for tall grass, weeds, parking on the grass, so on and so forth, <coughs> then we should be held to that same standard as well as the city. Secondly, I would hope that <clears throat> at some point we will get a presentation. I was somewhat taken aback when I read in the paper uh, this morning that um, uh, we're going to start 12 hour, hour shifts uh, with the police department uh, and we're, and, and we're going to start you know, in, in, in certain communities and doing so. And then the article went down to say that this is to uh, protect the police officers by putting two police officers in a, in, in, in a patrol car. And so I thought that the purpose was, you know, policing to protect our citizens. And so, one, when you go to 12-hour policing, and I know we talked about this some time ago, <clears throat> not in either for or against, I just think it's important to have that presentation. The last thing I would want to happen is a, a police officer working a 12-hour shift in some of those more fragile areas, and to have that officer not being able to uh, uh, respond effectively uh, the way that he or she would respond on an eight-hour shift. Uh, uh, because, again, if you go 12 hours, and again, that's because they're doing 12 hours don't mean they're sleeping the other 12. They got families, they have things that they're doing. So I would hate to have an officer that's not up to his full ability in terms of getting sleepy, irritated, so on and so forth, <clears throat> and he can't reason or they, it, it, they find himself in a situation where um, uh, he's not at his or her best. And so I would hope that, you know, as we go down this road, I, I, still, want to, want to, I still want to understand why we chose that particular area, you know. And I would hope that in the eight-hour shifts that we have now, that there is overlap, that there is not a period where uh, there, there are gaps from one shift. I know there's a shift coming on and a shift going off. And the, the tag time in terms of replacing those vehicles or uh, officers back on the street. So what I'm concerned about the safety and welfare and mental capacity of the officers, uh, 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 you know, as it relates to moving to a 12-hour shift. Uh, but more importantly, uh, with all the things that I've been talking about, uh, if it's if it's to, to have a, 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 a of a more pre more of a presence uh, on our streets. I would just hope that we would have, well, you make the, ultimately, you make that call. Uh, but I would at least hope to get that information to why we're doing it, um, who else is doing it, 
you know, where has it shown to be effective uh, in other communities? And what are the outcomes in terms of moving? Is it fiscally we're doing this to try to save a few dollars, or is it a safety <clears throat> issue? What the cause and effects are as it relates to this change? And our last thing I'll say, I'll continue to say this, I'm going to say it every week until we do meet and talk about this. <clears throat> Again, Mr. Riddick alluded to it. Uh, I'm concerned about the weapons that are on our streets. And uh, like I said, I know it's a, uh, there's 75% of this issue is parental, and 25% of it is us. Because again, we have the ability to change the social and economic tide in some of these fragile neighborhoods. That's what we sit here and do week in and week out. And so if, it, if we're concerned about certain areas, then we have the ability, just like we look at economic development projects, we have the ability to change the social and economic fabric of any community within the city. And we have a fiduciary responsibility to do so when we know that every week or Yearly, we look, we draw a, ma a circle around areas, and we know that every year we can point to the same areas and the same statistical data exists. And if we don't do nothing to improve that, then that's shame on us. But we can talk about all these other great feel-good projects that we do that, again, uh, provide economic stimulus in the city. But at the end of the day, it means absolutely nothing if people don't feel safe moving their families here sending their kids to our schools <clears throat> or businesses want to come here. And so, again, at the end of the day, I think that we, we were supposed to have an, an in-depth discussion at the retreat, and we did not. So I would hope that during one of these work sessions, we can talk about some of those issues. <coughs> would you prefer to have a, just a special meeting to talk about it as opposed to one of the work sessions, or as a work session? Well, I was, I, a meeting okay. is great, but I just think that we need to talk about it. Hell, we just spent the hour talking about chickens. You know, I want to talk about life. You know. Here, I know that the chief just stood up about the 12 hour shifts. That I could yeah, change just to everybody, I think we all read about it in the paper this morning about the 12 hour shifts. And that's, it's not the sort of thing that you would typically you know, have to go bias, and it is the manager's decision. But I do think the council is entitled to know that, you know, that, you know have, on what evidence the judgment will base. That's all. <coughs> It is up to the public safety experts to make that call. Right. 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 Well, I understand, but we don't have time now. But I, I'm sure there's a lot of thought. Well, well, the the chief is here. He's going to make a couple of comments, which is fine. We got time. Just to, to for the vice mayor's concerns, we share your concerns about the 12 hour shifts, but this is the reasoning that we're doing this in one patrol division. The main reason is because we think we'll get better service delivery to the citizens. It's not about making the police officers safe, it's about making the citizens safe. That's why we're looking at the 12 hour shift. This is not going on just in our area, it's going on nationwide. There's been a big shift study to see what works best for the police officers. They looked at eight hour shifts, they looked at 10 hour shifts, they looked at 12 hour shifts. We like the 10 hour shift, but quite frankly, logistically, it's hard to do because 10 does not divide into 24 well. Eight does, 12 does. We picked the 12 hour shift because we think that'll work. The reason it's in the third patrol division, quite frankly, is because the CO of the third patrol division was the architect of the plan. So we felt like because he was the architect of the plan, it was important that he have ownership over this project and run it in the third patrol division. That's the only reason the third patrol division was, was selected. And it's the entirety of the third patrol division. It's not one neighborhood, it's the entire patrol division. Every sector in that patrol division will be covered by this 12 hour shift. Uh, what we hope to accomplish is by going to two shifts, the two 12 hours, that eliminates a lot of the time that we spend in roll call doing that three sector transition that we go through right now. We're going to two sector transition, which is a lot, two shift transition, which is more efficient for us than the three, um, tran the three shift transitions we've got right now. Uh, that, there'll be no time that the street's not covered. We will stagger that so that the street is, is covered during those times. We're doing this on a trial basis. This is going to be done for six months because of the concerns that you've expressed. We want to measure while we're doing this officer fatigue. We want to make sure the officers are not getting too tired. We're going to look at our accident rate to see whether we're getting into more accidents. We'll look at our absenteeism to see whether we get more officers taking leave or calling in sick. 
We will look at our court attendance to make sure that we're not dropping our responsibility for court. Um, the benefit to the citizen, we hope, will be that because we go to the two 12-hour shift, is that frees up some personnel that we can do some enhanced community policing. So that's the thrust behind this, is to, <coughs> one, to make us more efficient, and to also try to get some enhanced uh, community policing out of it because we have more discretionary power, more discretionary manpower to do that. But again, I want to emphasize this on a trial basis because we want to make sure what we're doing is good for the citizens but also good for our officers. If we get to the end of the six months and we find out that our absenteeism doesn't look right, that our officers are too fatigued to work, that if our accident rate's going up, you know, we'll have to drop back and figure out a different way to do this. What we're trying to do is encourage some innovation and some creativity within the police department to make sure we address these problems. Uh, but like I said, it's, a, it's on a trial basis. But I would also point out that public safety is not the only group that works 12 hours. We have nurses that are working 12 hours. We have other folks that are in critical positions that work these types of shifts, and it seems to work for them. So we're doing it on an experimental basis on a small scale. And the reason, again, that's in one patrol division is if we have to unwind this, it's easier to unwind out of one than unwind out of all three. So that's that's just the short answer to, to what we're doing. Nurses don't have a gun, and they don't come up with, against some of the things that police officers have to encounter right. at night. I only had one question, and that was, do that 12-hour shift include officers going to court? Or that's an addition. If an officer finished a 12-hour shift, would he or she have to go to court after that? And then turn right, right, right around and start a another twelve-hour shift. We are adjusting our court calendar to try to ensure that the officers go into court while they are at work. So it's part of their twelve-hour shift. Now I can't control this. As the lawyers on council will tell you, I can't control when the <coughs> comes in or guarantee absolutely that an officer will not have to go to court while they're off duty. If that happens, we will do our best to make allowances to adjust that officer's schedule so we're not put somebody. On the street that hasn't had enough for us to be able to have it. <coughs> but you we, still, even we now, do that you have, now. Yeah, now you have night officers now. now. Yes, we do that who now. Are in court. officer tells us that he's yeah. too tired to come to work, if he or she is too fatigued, then we make allowances for that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I have every confidence in, in, in you. And so I'm just glad you're not starting it. I want the rationale, but I'm glad you're not starting in an area that's uh, prone to uh, <coughs> incidents more often than let's say an area that's not, and putting an officer in that and, you know, mental fatigue and then we have all types of other issues. So, you know, I appreciate you doing your due diligence and just looking at it and, you know, <coughs> looking, about, looking at whether or not it's something that we would move to long term, you know, rather than, you know, just cross the board, here we go with this, <coughs> this, this shift. So thank you for that. It's, it's, in, in, this, uh, in, in this patrol division, there are some areas of concentrated crime as well. We've got, we, we do have, every patrol, the way we split our patrol division is based on calls for service and crime rate. So everybody's about equal. So that's, that's you know, we, we do have areas in the third patrol division where we, we would consider challenging areas to police. So. And I, I know you will be concerned about this too. But um, as this has been discussed over the years, one of the concerns was the impact on the officers' families, yes, sir. family life, and that, that is certainly something we want you to consider as well. Absolutely. Yes, sir. But it's my understanding, and it first came up about a year ago, and I had talked to, to officers. If I remember, and correct if I'm wrong, Chief, a lot of them wanted to go to the 12 12. I mean, that was the line officers were seeking that. Um, I do have a, and, and, I, I believe this will probably assist with overtime issues that I know it's a sensitive topic today, but going to 1212 will alleviate certain overtime issues that officers were having. Um, and I think that may be an area that we'll see a benefit for them and everyone's, uh, because the officers are on eight, eight, eight and a half hours, but they're really working. They're working more than that. Uh, and I, I mean, that's my understanding. Just talking to them, like I, I've been told that. But yeah, that kills a lot of their, their part time. Work. It may it may well, affect their. Yeah, if you're yeah, but they've got other. They're going to be staggered. Twelve, yeah, twelve. More I mean, days off. Yeah, they're going to have more yes. days off. Yeah, so it may assist them with that by working the schedule. They will basically work two on, two off, two on, three off. Every other okay. every other three day off is a three day weekend. So there is yeah. a benefit to the officer. Yeah, there's a benefit. Yeah. I do that at the sheriff's office now. I'm just curious. 
How how was this information put out to the media? Because that article was everything that you just said. None of that. I'm reading. I have the article right here. None of that's really in there. And so here's another situation where there is information that's put out in the press. I don't know where it came from, but it doesn't do justice to what the whole point of this is. In fact, it got political talk about Regina Williams would never support this. I'm just, I believe what happened, and believe me, I had some issues with my PIOs when I saw the article come out because we had not made a press release on this at all. Uh, this was an internal working thing with us. I believe what happened is when we had the meeting with the Civic Leagues to explain to them what was happening in their area, one of the Civic Leagues placed it on their website, and that's where the media picked it up. At least that's what I'm getting from our public information officers, and then it grew from there. See, I wonder which Civic League that was. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. The other thing I think is important, too, in stories like this and others, is that we can put out the information, and we have no control over what <coughs> the pilot or the news takes out of that and prints. You know, we can put it into some kind of great um, uh, press release, but... You know, they make a few phone calls and they're able to take the story and turn it into, you know, whatever it is. That, I mean, I've had conversations with reporters for 30, 40 minutes and nothing I said has been, you know, quoted in the newspaper and it's been a totally different, you know, it's been totally different when it gets in the paper. So, you know, we can put it out there. That's what Coach Wilder's saying now. That's right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's important to keep in mind. Well, it yeah, wasn't ran by was, somebody who normally is here. So yeah. No, I mean, I'm just, you know. Uh, Angela, do you have any, do you have any issues? Um, no. Somebody Between like? Mr. Riddick and uh, Mr. Murphy, <laughs> that whole police so you can, thing okay. was, yeah. Can we even have a council meeting now? Yes. <laughs> yeah, we can. Go ahead. Oh, well, I wanted Barkley to hear this, but um, there's a uh, issue that's kind of brewing down in Ocean View with sand dunes, and um, I don't know if you've received any letters, uh, but Barkley and I are starting to get them. The dunes are getting so tall and big that they are now blocking views of people who bought houses um, to get a view. They're also um, going into people's yards to the point that they can't even open up their back doors uh, because the sand is just piling up. And I think what, what's happening is with the dunes are protected and they respect that, but as far as mitigation is concerned and making sure that there's still a, a quality of life. Uh, it's a quality of life issue with it. And um, I think some people are afraid to mess with the dunes, <laughs> uh, which they should be because it is, you know, a violation, but they, they're looking for some assistance, primarily in the cottage line area and the um, East Ocean View. I don't think the dune issue is as big down at the Willoughby area. And Barclay, I was just talking about the dunes getting too tall uh, down in Ocean View, and the complaints are starting to come in with that. I don't think it's necessarily Willoughby. It's more of the center part of where the dunes are growing. And a lot of people suggested city needs sand, take it from the dunes, yeah, um, put them at a safe is height. That a, and, um, is that a state issue? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but they just want the people down there are asking for better engagement from the city on it. I think that they... There's been some conversations at the Civic League area, and the approach has not been necessarily as supportive as some of the citizens would like. And when people can't open up their doors, um, you know, and I'm hearing it from one side, so um, there could be more to the story as there usually is, but um, we can get somebody on it. That's it. Okay. Um, I asked Brett to give me the calendar for November. We have, a, we have two city council work sessions, which is, we come in at two. One's on the 6th and one's on the 20th. What if we get the manager to bring us an agenda on the 6th? <coughs> we could then discuss, so we, so you'll get everything on there. We want this to be quite a, an holistic discussion, not just with the chief and us, but maybe there might be some other stakeholders you want in here. And, and yes, yeah, some, some, some of the schools. And so maybe by the 6th, you can have an agenda that we can look at and okay with you. So we have a good discussion. And then we'll come in on the 30th, on the 20th. That's the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. So I guess most people will be around. That's school. The, the 20th? <coughs> yeah, the school. Oh, shoot. Uh, 
<coughs> All right, well, we'll find another day. Uh, maybe we what we'll do is come in on, on the 20th. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, let's see. When, when to jail. We had all of those folk in here. Well, we're not meeting on yeah, the 27th. The jail. Yeah, but they, 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 they got them in there, so they, they, they deal with them and talk to them. We could have an afternoon meeting on the 27th. The juvenile detention center. That's the coming out of jail. They're coming out of jail. No, that's the, the, the 20th is. The after. <laughs> the no, yes, it's the 27th. We can actually have it. Yeah. 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 So let's see if the 27th works in the people's calendar. If it doesn't, that is the Tuesday after Thanksgiving. We don't have a council session that day. So we can carve out just, we can come at any moment that day. We can come at 2, we can come later. So we do have the we do have the, the school system in here on the twentieth. We had a hard time getting that. Do we we not have a meeting on the twenty seventh because it's after a holiday? It's Is the fourth one? Tuesday. But we normally have a meeting on the fourth right. Tuesday. It's usually a night meeting. It's not the fifth. No, I'm looking at the twenty seventh. Tuesday is a. Uh, I think there's nothing on the twenty seventh. There is no council right okay. now. <coughs> so let's let's just talk about uh, having the uh, discussion about. Uh, the crime issues on that day. I did see some FBI statistics that talked about it. higher crime, violent crime across the entire country that they looked at, I guess, in 11, 2011. Um, so we'll try for the 27th. Um, Tommy, you're finished. Yep. On the 30th, we have the uh, work session with the General Assembly delegation. So um, you should get notice of that. So please try to get that on your calendar. We'll see how, member, how many members of the General Assembly show up, but I think we should have a pretty good return. And um, Paul will come out that day. I'm in Chicago that day. We're good with everybody, it looks like. Uh, six of the eight General Assembly delegation members have confirmed attendance. Right, okay, that's good. That's a good record. Okay. All right, good enough. Good to go. All right, it's up to you. Sounds good. Good evening. Mayor, City Council, City Manager. The purpose of this presentation is to provide you some information of the senior and disabled tax relief program that we offer in the city of Norfolk. The presentation will cover a little bit about real estate tax, we'll give you an uh, overview of the program, comparison to other localities, the status of the program, and possible options for restructuring. This is one of the programs that we are looking as part of the city manager's tax restructuring package. And once we're finished with our review, if it's a candidate, we will bring back recommendations to you. So real briefly on the real estate tax that we have in Norfolk. As you know, the real estate tax is the largest locally generated revenue source. Of the property taxes, 31% of the property taxes, 24% is made up of real estate tax. That's about $195 million. However, you know that not all property in Norfolk is taxable. 36% of our property is off the tax rolls. 64% is on our tax rolls, and that's about $17 billion. That equates to the $195 million worth of revenue. It is from this 64% that we offer our senior and disabled tax relief program. So taking a look of over t about 23 years, real estate in Norfolk, we only saw one decline in 1995. You see the negative of 0.3, and even then that was not a residential decline. In 2011, 12, and 13, we have seen three consecutive years of real estate decline. Cumulatively, that's about 8.4% decline, and that equates to about $15 million of loss in revenue. That mill is taxable. I'm sorry? That mill is taxable. Is that just non-taxable in the traditional sense, or is that also inclusive of properties that we own that we're not getting any properties tax that we own revenue well. from it's, also? It's state, federal, okay. locally owned, it's anything. So that number could change a little 
if as we sell properties right. and they come back on the tax roll. Correct. I okay. believe last year it was like 37 percent. Okay. So, and we'll talk about this, the Senior and Disabled Tax Relief Program. This is a, about a 40-year-old program. We've been offering it since fiscal year 1974. Um, and to qualify for this program, you've got to meet certain criteria. You have to be at least 65 years of age or totally and permanently disabled and live in the property. You cannot have a combined household income of more than 67000 And your net worth, can, net worth exclusive of the home cannot exceed 350000 we offer the relief in basically five, five relief brackets. The highest relief amount that you can get is 100%, and you cannot exceed the income of 28611 <coughs> The lowest relief that you can get is 20%, and you have to be between 53654 to 67000 There are a couple of caveats in this. The first 10000 of a uh, senior's Exemption, the first 10000 of each relative is excluded from that calculation. If you are classified as a disabled exemption, the first 10000 of the disabled <coughs> citizen is exempted from the calculation. More than half of our participants in this program do fall within the 100% relief bracket. So comparing us regionally, you can see that we have the highest income level Income, maximum income level of 67,000. Virginia Beach is second with 63,450. We are on par for the net worth with 350,000 with Virginia Beach and Chesapeake. <coughs> I'll also tell you that there are four Hampton Road cities. <coughs> what we're showing here in this graph are the tax exemptions. There are four Hampton Road cities that offer tax freezes. That's Portsmouth, Hampton, Chesapeake, and Virginia Beach. So if we look at ourselves compared to um, statewide, uh, according to a 2011 Weldon Cooper survey of local tax rates, the minimum household income maximum was 15000 and the maximum was 74750 The net worth minimum was 25000 and the maximum was 540 I'll tell you that the maximum amounts were for cities in Northern Virginia. So we're between the range. A minimum amount, mm -hmm. does that include, that's exclusive of the residents? For the net worth. Right. For the net worth. So it include, includes or excludes the residents? It excludes it. Okay. <clears throat> so looking back at our program for the last 10 years, uh, since 2002 to 2012. Sabrina, I'm yes, sorry. sir. I guess, for clarity, if I'm correct, that, that that maximum, Northern Virginia has a higher um, threshold for net worth than, than Hampton Roads? Yes, they're at 540, <coughs> we're at 350. Okay. Does that answer your question? Um, looking back over 10 years, our, our program has quadrupled. We went from 2.1 in 2002 to about 7.5 million in 2012. We peaked in 2010 with 8.55 million. Now I will tell you that um, as the assessments grew, council did act. In 2006, when our assessments grew 16.8 percent, you changed the income limit to 50,000 and you changed the net worth limit to 200,000. Prior to that, it was the income was 34,450 and net worth was 100,000. In 2007, when our assessments peaked at 25% increase, you changed it again to 52,000 for income and net worth to 350. Since then, since 2007, we haven't changed the net worth. In 2008, we peaked with the assessments again at 17.5% increase, and you raised the income level to 62,000. And in 2009, we peaked again with 5.8 in increase in assessments, and you changed it to 67,000. And that's where we're holding right now. So as the assessments have started to go decline, we haven't changed the levels yet. So looking at our participation rate over 10 years, we've doubled. In 2002, we had about 2,700 participants. In 2012, we now have about 4,800 participants. When, when did the wall change? that raised the maximum? Um, no, it was, I think as of 2011, there was no maximum. No, well, the 350, where it allowed us to change it to 350? 
Because we weren't always at 350, right? That's we right. Were, we were the, not. Right. So when did that change happen? I don't know when the. When, do you know when? 2002. It, it's 2006. Okay. But it, so, it, was any of that this change attributed to the? I think it was mostly attributed to the assessment climbing, and we wanted to provide more relief. Okay. To the, to the residents. But I believe in 2011 the law changed and there are no maximums imposed. <clears throat> so if we look at it, um, <clears throat> keep going. On a statewide basis, <clears throat> according to the Auditor of Public Accounts Comparative Report of 2011, Norfolk ranks second amongst all cities in Virginia for providing property tax relief for seniors and disabled. Virginia Beach is the first. So we provide about, I guess, uh, about 7.4 million back in 2011, and Virginia Beach provided 15.5. Now, you just mean that's on a dollar basis, right? right? Yes, it's on that's a dollar not basis. On a There's no, nothing that's leveled in that thing. That's just the big. Virginia Beach's number is higher because they're over twice our Correct. population. They, okay. they are, their population is about 437,000 to 442,000. And their real estate tax revenue is more than double ours. And if we compare ourselves to Chesapeake, Chesapeake is about 225,000 in population, and they have about 25 million more in real estate tax revenue. So I think better comparison is probably towards Chesapeake. So if we look at, if we add counties into this mix, we rank, we rank fourth among cities and counties. <coughs> Fairfax County, First, Virginia Beach, second, and Ryko, third, and then it's Norfolk. Chesapeake is number 11, um, and they provide about 2.9 million. Now, if we flip towards the how we look as a, uh, as a fiscally sound city, Norfolk is ranked 13th as a fiscally stressed locality in Virginia, and that is from the 2010 report from Commission on Local Government. The fiscal stress, there's about four categories. There's high stress, above average stress, below average stress, and low stress. If you notice on the, on the left-hand side, Norfolk is 13. The other three cities and counties that we talked about earlier in the earlier slide, Virginia Beach, Fairfax, and Henrico, they are either in below stress or low stress. So while we have a high stress category, we still provide a good amount of senior tax relief. One time we were first. Yes. So if we look at the, the 2013 program as it is now, as you know, we set aside about $6 million in our budget for to provide uh, relief. That amount is about $1.5 million less than what we did in 12. In 13, we are also transi transitioning the program from the Commission of Revenues Office to the Department of Human Services. And... Um, Going forward, if we look at the breakdown based on data that we received from the Commissioner of Revenue's Office, a complete set back in August, um, and I'm just going to go through the first line as an example <coughs> in the tax brackets. On the left-hand side is the 100% relief bracket. The minimum tax relief that was provided to a participant was $400. The maximum was $7,260. The average in that tax relief category was about $1,700. The total tax relief is 4.2 for 2,450 participants. If you add them all up together on the right-hand side, we have about 4,200 participants. The majority of our participants fall within the 100% relief bracket. That's about 58% of, of the population. Now, these numbers will change as the year progresses because you, you'll have debts, you'll have change in ownership, you have income eligibility changes, audit audits that happen and they fall out of the program. So these numbers won't stay the same. If you take a look at the corresponding slide from, I guess, the one previous and this one, in that 100 relief percent back bracket, that person who got, or that participant who received $400 in relief, you can equate that to a $36,000 home. The participant who received the $7,200 relief, you can equate that to a $654,000 home. Now, it looks like we're providing a lot of relief when you look at the maximum home values. It's pretty high. But I will tell you that 93% of the homes are $250,000 or less. 
So now we get into a little bit of restructuring. As you've seen, the, the program has grown uh, and our real estate assessments are <coughs> dropping. So as they drop, we should consider restructuring the program. Um, and we've laid out some options. There are no particular order. We haven't fleshed all of them out yet. We're still analyzing it. But I'll briefly talk about a few of these in a little bit more detail. But 1A, there are five of them listed. There's uh, one, one A and one B, they're spin-offs of each other. One A uh, basically says we eliminate the tax exemption and we offer only a deferral program. That is now Newport News' model. One B says we cap the total amount, and this is sort of a two-tiered approach. You cap the total amount of exemption in 2014, and then you go to a, a tax deferral model in 2015. Option two is to cap the amount of tax exemption each participant can receive. Option three is to modify that tax relief schedule. That's the five um, relief brackets that we talked about. Option four is to include net worth as a factor in determining the amount of tax exemption. I'll give you an example of that. And option five is to cap the total amount of tax exemption available at a, whatever amount that we decide and then prorate for what's not um, enough. Now, there are various combinations and localities offer them in various combinations. We will have to find one that works or not change it at all. So if we go look at option one in a little bit more detail, several localities in the region offer the tax deferral as well as a tax exemption. Again, Newport News now only offers tax deferral. Hampton offers a tax exemption as well as tax deferral. Um, and so does Virginia Beach. Believe it or not, Norfolk also offers a tax deferral. However, our tax deferral um, parameters are the same as the tax exemption parameters. So when you offer the same parameters, no one's going to select a tax deferral option. They're all going to select a tax exemption option. When Hampton offers the tax exemption, that 50000 you see there for deferral, the tax exemption income limit is 31000 And for Virginia Beach, it's 63450 Now, option 1B is to cap the total amount of exemption in, in 2014 and eliminate the deferral. As we said, we would say that maybe you cap it at 3 or $4 million of exemption, and then we'd have to figure out some sort of prorated method to meet the need. And then we go to, we move towards a completely deferral program in 2015. So for, moving on to option two, you can cap the amount of tax exemption each participant can receive. Again, localities do this in several methods. Suffolk actually um, says that they cannot exceed the tax value of the median assessment for a single family residential property. Their median assessment is $207,000. If we translate that to Norfolk, Norfolk's median assessment is about 165000 And if we cap it, relief is about $1,800 for relief. In James City County, they, do, they, they say that the, you can't exceed the tax value of the first $120,000 of a home's assessed value. Anything above that, the resident would pay. So again, there are various ways that we can maneuver in that option. Some localities, again, according to the Weldon Cooper survey in 2011, they cap, the cap can range from 100 to 1,600. If you include counties, it ranges from 100 to $2,000. Option three, this is the, when we... And we were doing it, we had people getting $2,400 and more. Mm -hmm. We just have to find the right method to do it, either it's by median, in, median assessed value or average assessed value. Yeah. You could even link it to the poverty rate or the median income levels. Option three, we play with the, um, the, the tax brackets. In this, and this is just an example, we had five relief brackets before. We compressed them to three. In this scenario, two of the relief brackets see no change. That is your 100% your relief and your 20% relief participants, they see no change. But the folks who are getting 80%, 60%, or 40% will now see a change. So if somebody who was receiving, who had a maximum income of 40000 and they were receiving 60%, they would now fall within the 50% relief category. Someone who was receiving 50000 or who had 50000 in income level, 
and they used to get 40,000, will now receive 20% in relief. Option four is including net, net worth as a factor in determining the tax exemption. Right now, our net worth is max of 350,000. As long as you meet that cap, it, it, it's fine. And as long as you meet the income levels, you, you get the relief provided. But if we set the net, the net with income cap at you know two hundred thousand, and we say anyone who has any more than two hundred thousand one dollars to three hundred fifty, now your relief rate is revised. So your hundred percent folks would now receive seventy five percent, and so on down the line. Again, we'd have to find something that works for us. Option five is to just set an amount. We cap it at four or five million. I'm sorry. Do you have an average of the net worth of the individuals who receive 100 percent? Was that that I missed that? No, I don't think we had the average of 100 percent. Okay. The net worth. Do you have that with you? No. We can get a few if you need. Okay. I just like to see where it. Sure. So if we cap the amount at three to four or five million, whatever we decide, then we have to figure out how do we do that. Do we do we say that the hundred the folks who receive the hundred percent relief now continue to get it, and then we prorate everyone else, or do we just prorate everyone to begin with? And we have to find the the happy medium there. We've got to find it where we're protecting our most vulnerable citizens, but also protecting the city's revenue. So I'll leave you with some final thoughts which is the real estate tax, again, is the city's largest locally generated revenue source. As the real estate assessments decline, we do recommend that you look at changes to the tax relief program. We are looking at various methods, again, keeping an eye towards our revenue loss, but also protecting the citizens who need it most. Um, and just according to the VEC, seniors ages 65 through 74 are projected to grow by 30% over the next 10 years. So this program does have the potential to continue to grow. Sabrina, yes, sir. Have you, part of this, I don't know how it plays into it, this reverse mortgage situation that's now becoming fairly pre prevalent, prevalent, excuse me. Somebody could potentially take their net worth, pay off their six or seven hundred thousand dollar house, and then get a reverse mortgage and be paid monthly. And that would can really skew in my mind, am I missing something? I mean, nope. that would drop their net worth exclusive of their house. They could have a huge house, pay it off, and be moving well, tax free because they had zero little income. Except, I guess, the, I don't know whether that reverse mortgage, how that applies, but uh, it's something you might want to keep in mind because that's you know, a lot of people go into that now. And, and that, to me, might move the needle a little bit one way or the other. I don't. I think I quite understand how yet. And it's the reverse income. I didn't think it was included. I didn't think that money that they got was included as income. Is I don't that know that. That's the question. And then the net worth is gone. It's all. I don't think that it's considered as income, y'all. No. I don't. I don't know that. But you can certainly get rid of your net worth by paying your house off or getting a nice big house and then go back to and get around it. I mean, I don't know that anybody would do that, but it's... Oh, no, no, they're doing it now. But there are people living in, you know, as you said, five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars houses and paying, getting tax. That's not who this is intended for, in my mind, for any of this tax relief. That's why I like the number two, because it, it, number two will, will uh, bleed the fraud out of the program. There is something... You have to go back. Two is deferral, right? Right. Yeah, right. I, hear you. I mean, because people are not going to get it if they really don't need it with the yeah. deferral program. I guess on deferral you would pay and say all of the transfer of the property. Correct. Yeah, well, yeah. When you when you yeah, when it's you transfer the property. The that means the city will the city money. will the city will get their money at some point. Right. That's that was a solution years ago. The assessments were going up and people were who didn't qualify for any of that. And, and to the extent that people live in some place else and are claiming, you know, that they ought to get some exemption here, the deferral takes, helps with, relieve that issue, right? That's, that's what we have. Yeah. Well, they have to be in the residence. It has to be their I know, but some people residence. are just following no, these not, uh, papers. Yeah. They may move after they file them. They may, you know, it's... You got a lot of it. So yeah. what I'm saying is... The communities that have gone them, there. You went... Uh, that sounds just, drops off. Drop off. Huh? Some communities that have gone to the deferral system 
some of the people have dropped out of it. Right, out of because out of they don't system. want their house to be, or their heirs to have to pay uh, that money when they either sell it or that give the person a transfer living or that. Or right. sale. But what about the people who are at the bottom end of the scale, who they're at the thirty-six thousand dollar value? That's who we're aiming for. I know it's who we're aiming for, but my question is: if we go to deferral, then there should be some way, in my opinion, to exempt the people of some at some real estate level if we're using the value of the home on the low end. On the on the low end, so that I mean, if they don't have anything then they probably don't have a lot to leave to their heirs. So their house is probably the only thing that they have to leave with their heirs and maybe a little insurance policy or something or another like that. But I don't think that we should defer. I mean, people live until they're 80, 90 years old. From 65 years old, if they're on a deferment until they're 85 and then, you know, they pass away and then they owe the, the heirs owe all this money from the sale of the property, then the heirs end up with nothing. Okay. What's the problem? No, it's not okay. I'm trying to figure out what's the problem. The problem is, I don't think it's right. Well, that's people, the right. If they have, if, if they're living in a property that's thirty-five or forty or fifty thousand dollars and they're <coughs> making twenty-eight thousand dollars or twenty-five thousand dollars, it's probably safe to say that they don't have three hundred and fifty thousand dollars somewhere. So if they have a... The person has passed away. They passed away. Okay. So the benefit goes to the individual that lived in the house. Why should the city come back on that individual's heirs and say, if you sell the property, you owe all this money, and then you end up with nothing? Or pay the money, keep the property, whatever the case may be. I just don't think it's right. If, if I may. On the low end of the totem pole. Now, if you're in a $600,000 house or you're in a $500,000 house or whatever the case may be, then that's different. Let, but, let's, say, let's say their their, their their kids have been very successful, live in another state, or stay right here, live in a $500,000 home, okay, doing very well for themselves. This is not about them. They didn't apply, nor did they get in the program. This is about the, the little lady that's, that's staying in her house trying to provide relief for her so she would not be adversely affected and she could have a quality of life, you know, while she's in that house and not have to worry about someone coming and knocking at her door and putting her out. <clears throat> at the end of the day, again, she could hop in or they could hop out, but at the end of the day, it provides future revenue for the city and it's equal across the board. No one is treated differently. I understand what you're saying, and all I'm saying is I don't believe someone who's living in a modest house with below modest means should leave a tax burden to the sale of their home to their kids, no matter how much their kids make. I don't think they should do that. If they're living, if they get the benefit of the program, then there should not be any kind of... Um, they don't get should, the benefit. No, the, if, the, if the person, if the senior citizen is getting the benefit of the program, they shouldn't have to make a decision am I gonna am I gonna get the benefit of this program and not have to pay taxes on this house or if I want to leave the house to my kids what regardless of what the kids make if I want to leave the house to my kids then I have to scramble to try to pay real estate taxes or lose my house because I can't pay them Can I, I, I just I disagree we're, we're ranked 13 as a fiscal aid you know what's the word uh, stress, stress, stress city What's the bottom line here? What is the city trying to save off of this by fixing the program? I, are, are, we're looking at a $2 million savings here because we obviously need that money in there. And, and which one of those gets us there to the, the fastest? If that's what you're basically asking us. Well, he told me I couldn't tell you what the gap number was, so... <laughs> He's not here. He can watch my camera later. <laughs> what, what I, what I, what I would you Marcus, would you like me to repeat my question? I'd ask because we're ranked 13th in fiscally stressed city. What's the bottom line? What are we trying to get to here? What is the city trying to save off of this? And which one of those gets us there 
the fastest, if that's <laughs> okay. Instead of giving us sure. options, where do, where are you trying to get out sure. of this? And okay. get the fraud out sure. of it or whatever. Okay. Okay. Sabrina wouldn't answer. Sure. Okay, well, yeah, two, two things. <laughs> um, and, and I think you, you nailed the point. Um, as the mayor said, for years we were the top three being the most fiscally stressed locality in the state. So we're 13. That means it's, it's better. Um, but being fiscally stressed is really your ability to generate revenue. Because we have 36% of the properties, real estate properties, off the tax rolls, it's very difficult for us to generate revenue. So even though we're ranked 13th, and if that screen was behind me, you would see those red bars with other localities that have low fiscal stress that's providing a great level of relief. So it just, the model doesn't really work for us to provide that level of relief with the stress that we have. So the simple answer is, to collect all the revenue that we, we could, and the deferral would work. Um, to some extent, and you said don't put fraud in, just you know what would be most advantageous for the city. But as oh, you I, said getting fraud out. No, is, he I said, said, said also getting fraud. Said also oh, sure, also okay. getting fraud. Yeah. All right, so, right, so um, Newport News, we can use this for example, and spread from wrong, please step in, is that they did do, I think, option 1B, where they um, did a two steps to go to the deferral program. And in the year, Let's say, so it took two years. Year one, a number of people just dropped out of the program. Just just dropped out of the program, even before the deferral came into place. So while we're not providing a recommendation to you to answer your question, what would be most advantageous for us is to make sure those people who the program is designed to assist, that we're helping them. And I do believe that, you know, to some extent, what we're trying to do is address those individuals at the low end of the spectrum Need the who need the help? Right. So what do you want? What do you? What is your recommendation, My recommendation. for the cap? Then, oh, the, I, 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 what's your dollar figure? What are you trying to get out of this? Sure. How much money? Um, <laughs> I hate to put it that way, yeah. but I'm trying to make this simple. Uh, it's uh, what we could do. We could start off and say, okay, let's start off and say, let's look at everybody. Let's start with the data. So if we took the twenty-eight thousand six eleven or whatever the lowest number is, and we try to say, okay, who are those individuals? the lowest level of, of income that's coming in and the lowest net worth. And I don't know if that's you know, 50% or 30% or 45% of the folks. But I think that's where we start. And we try to see what is the dollar amount that's related to them. Because it's it was eight, we're eight million basically is what we, we give out now. And I, of course, he's, he's saying 7.5 last year. 7.5, right, yeah. That's sure. in 12. Right, and then. Okay. Looking at the graph of the hundred percenters, it looked like that was the biggest expense was right. about four, just over four million. Right. Correct. Right. 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 So then the other, the other three and a half million is the bottom tier, roughly. Or anything. Above yeah, it, maybe yes. five or six. Sure. Okay. Sure. But, but we're, we're giving. We 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 set aside. I'm going to start off about six million. All right. Then you set another million aside at about seven million. But when you look at the monies that we would collect in future years. So this is money that we would have normally got if everybody was paying into the pot. So now we bring down from an expenditure what we put out on the front end. And then you can't really project them, but you know that whatever that, that, that income, the, the number of residents that you have out there at some point, we got an aging infrastructure, a lot of seniors in this community, that at some point that money comes back in. You know? And so it helps you in terms of a city that 36 percent off the tax rolls and I, and, I, and I just looking at this I said this with Mark and I said there's fraud ramp there's run, there's fraud running rampant throughout our system you know we and verify. Huh? we don't verify mm -hmm. we, ver we don't verify it very much no we, we, we haven't we, right. we, we we're you know we we've, we've identified some and we're moving forward on them. I mean, if we We've been able to look at uh, some cases, not knowing that people were on senior tax relief, look at it, <coughs> you know, and be like, oh, this doesn't look right. And then investigate it a little further and find that, you know, we got some issues. So when Marcus had talked about the various approaches, you know, I, I, you got five different approaches. But one, you, if, if you looked at the deferral, at least on a temporary basis, you would be able to, you know, to quickly define who needs it, who don't, but what it would do is clean the fraud out of your system. Once you get that fraud out of your system, you can go back and take another look at it.
But one of the things we have to do, we're leaving a lot of money on the table right now. Yeah. The commissioner's office does do an audit. Last year, they did audits, um, and I think they dropped about $200,000 $200, off. I mean, they recollected about $200,000. So there are periodic audits. It's probably good that we do a more extensive audit, and I know what? managers ask John Sandel and go in as well. well let me what kind you of come back to us with yeah. this. Okay. Yeah. Yes, now you've got the proposition out of the table. Right. And now you're going to come back to us with your recommendation. Yes. Yeah. With your considered yes. strong recommendation. Yes. Not just. Okay. And and is it interest-free deferment? Interest-free deferment. Is it interest-free deferment? Deferral? Deferral, yeah. Um, I, I think our section of the code says about 5% annually. There'll be interest on it. But again, that would be, I mean, we'd have to work with legal. <laughs> it would be a discretion of the council if they wanted to defer it, if they wanted to do it interest-free or um, put interest on it. The audits that were done, what was the number one reason for rejecting that? Do you, do you have that information? But see, to your point, Mayor, about the, the, the ask, um, I guess it's uh, it's October, so we wanted to make sure that we talked about something significant like this okay. in October, not in February and March, just right. as we start to roll out a budget process. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, so we do have three items that come up tonight uh, for a formal vote. And the, and the first one is the bus transfer station a conversation. And what I will do, Mayor and Council, is that I do believe yesterday we sent you a, um, a packet, a small packet, I think it was about six, six pages, which uh, basically outlined the number of sites that we reviewed. Um, I think that's pretty important because it was nearly 20 sites that were reviewed, uh, but then we got down to the uh, sites that we gave a, a, I guess, a higher level of scrutiny. And the map that you have in front of you, right, which is behind <coughs> me, so I started off with the, those nearly 20 sites, and ultimately we were able to narrow it down to about a handful of sites because we said one of the key criteria would be uh, the walking distance to downtown and or the distance uh, to a light rail station. Um, with that said, we were able to then just uh, deal with four areas, which were really the uh, transportation operations of HRT, the timing to actually develop the structure, the capital costs and the operating costs. Uh, we uh, have um, William Harrell here, the CEO of uh, HRT, and as well as uh, Ray Amoruso. But if you will, Mayor and Council, if it's fine, I'd like John Kuyper to come up and very quickly just tell you about the uh, the four criteria for these handful of sites. Again, started at about 20, narrowed it down to five. You have the map, and he wants to talk a little bit about the criteria for the, these five. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, there were, uh, after we went through the screening process, there were five locations that merited the most attention, and I believe you have seen that in the the memo, the, the Greyhound site, the Golden Triangle, the downtown plaza <coughs> at St. Paul's, Wood Street and Posey Lane, and, and Harbor Park. And we did take a thorough look at each of those. And the, the uh, Greyhound site, which is, uh, you know, shown up there, one of the locations, uh, <coughs> there is excellent access. However, ingress and egress are a bit constrained. The circulation is a little bit diff difficult there. Uh, timing is a challenge because there'd be time needed for acquisition, demolition, and redevelopment of some property there. That would also lead to a higher capital cost of <coughs> nine to fifteen million dollars, as w and uh, including demolition and relocation of the Greyhound operations. The the operating costs would be comparable there to the other locations. The Golden Triangle site uh, had has excellent access and circulation, but there is relatively long time frame needed for acquisition, demolition, and redevelopment <coughs> because it involves purchasing the Golden Triangle Hotel, uh, demolition of that, relocation of the cellular antennas there, and we had an estimated cost of 19 to $20 million uh, for that site. The downtown plaza at St. Paul's, which is the site that's recommended, also has excellent access and circulation and capacity for expansion. 
Uh, this one has the shortest time frame because the city does own the, the property already. Uh, there's minimal demolition just to the ABC building and an interim facility could be placed close by on Wood Street. The estimated cost is four to five million dollars for, for that site. Uh, another one just north of there on Wood Street and Posey Lane, just uh, north of the fire station, uh, also has excellent access and circulation capacity for future expansion. However, it's near some uh, historic sites, the churches to the north, and we believe that they would require a full environmental impact statement, and uh, that would add significantly to the time. We would also need to do a little bit more demolition of some of the warehouses up there and some improvements to Posey Lane and probably some things to protect the historic churches. Uh, the final site then was, was Harbor Park, and uh, that has the most restricted access of the location. Site, lo site circulation would be sufficient, and there are opportunities for expansion. However, there, are, uh, there is uh, a long time frame needed for acquisition and infrastructure improvements. It would require a realignment of Holt Street to provide a better connection to Tidewater Drive so you wouldn't be uh, re relying just on, on uh, uh, the, the existing infrastructure to get in and out of there. Uh, there would be land acquisition associated with that, also the need for improvements to Water Street and construction of a 650-space parking deck to replace the parking that's lost there that supports the tides and the operating cost impact would be a little bit higher there, a um, few hundred thousand dollars higher because of the longer bus routes in and out of the site. Be happy to answer questions about any of those or other sites that you might see on the uh, map there. I have a question about the St. Paul's one. Uh, when the bus, looking at the diagram, there's no exit right there to St. Paul, so the majority of the buses would be coming out of Wood Street. Uh, the, the, no, the, well, the, the majority of them would be traveling north on Church Street to get to Brambleton Avenue by the post office. That, that street is quite wide there. The only ones that would come really on Wood Street would be the ones that are, have a destination or, or traveling through downtown. Would they only be making right-hand turns at the Wood Street? Uh, that, that would, well, uh, there might be a few that would turn left. Left. Yeah, the, yeah that, they would be turning left to come into downtown. The ones that were going to the north, it would probably be easier for them to go that, Church that's Street. That's where my major concern is, is that left-hand turn on the St. Paul's from Wood and what that does to, the, off of Wood, uh, what it does to traffic. And I'm wondering if there's a way that those buses can just go down. I mean, I don't know how much it's adding on, but could they go down to Brambleton instead of cutting through right there? I mean, is it going to make that much of a difference in... Yeah. Yeah. Um, councilman and mayor and fellow council people, um, the 6 eight, the routes 6, 8, 45, 9, 60, 9, 61, do that today. They make a left turn on Princess Anne to go down St. Paul's Boulevard because they all have to either get to 264 or they have to get across um, to Portsmouth via a different method or loop around downtown. So. They're making the left turn today out of Cedar Grove and Princess Anne and traveling southbound in St. Paul's. So they would be replicating that pattern just at Wood Street instead of right, Princess Anne. Right, right. But it's oranges and apples. There's not as much traffic down at Cedar Grove that there is over here. They're still traveling all the way down to Waters, Waterside. Right. I'm not, I'm just, I'm talking about buses crossing through an intersection where there's already traffic that is backed up every day and, and causing more congestion. I, 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 you guys offered to meet with me. I didn't have a chance to meet with you. That asked that is, those buses crossing an intersection, making a left-hand turn on the St. Paul's, where there is already congestion happening there. Is there a way to just make those left those buses go down to Brambleton and use the light and come up instead of blocking that that access? If necessary, I'm asking, yes, sir. That's, yes, sir. Uh, you know, there, there is a signal at Wood Street where there is traffic coming out, turning left. You know, you have a few buses an hour doing that. If that tur turned out to be a problem, then you know you could go up Church Street and around Brambleton Avenue if, if that's necessary. Just, I'm just looking at a light cycle there and knowing I've been stuck in that light a couple times trying to get meeting to meetings here and knowing putting two buses or three buses through that intersection and packing it up, could we just shift it down to Brambleton where it there's a little bit, it's a bigger intersection there's more clearance for the bus to get through. Uh, it's a bigger, probably a longer light. Just asking. 
Yes, sir. We'll, we'll I mean, and we'll you can still do the right hand turns are fine because there's no traffic generally going right hand. It's that left hand turn coming in the downtown. <clears throat> While the routing of that is certainly possible, the more route miles you add to a route, the more the operating cost is going to be, and that cost would be put back to the city of Norfolk to bear in terms of operation, annual operating costs increase. Because the circuitous pattern you just described, they still have a, a reason to go into downtown. So you may make them go right and may make them loop around, but they still have to go downtown. They still have to go down St. Paul's, across Waterside, up Bush Street to finish their, their loop around downtown. They provide service to destinations in downtown. I don't disagree with you on that, but also we're building a $5 million station, which also helps HRT. So I'm asking as a compromise in this, this is my one issue with this, is it something that you guys can consider with this? Because right now I'm leading the vote for it, this, but I've had an issue with this traffic as well as some other council members on this, and that is a small intersection. That is not a large intersection, and we know that that's going there. What the operating cost can't be that much more to run this up to Brambleton and move it, you know, just over Wynn Street, you know, and come, still come up. It's just not blocking that intersection. Yeah, we, we will evaluate that and be able to share that cost. I did want to add, Mr. Mayor, members of council, one of the concerns that was raised last time, obviously, were the capital costs. Uh, Mr. Amoruso has identified a state grant. Uh, under the Public Transportation and Commuter uh, Service Program. Uh, we believe that's a 50% match, and the deadline for that grant is February 1st, Mr. Ma uh, Manager. So we will certainly commit to submitting a grant for 2 to $3 million to hopefully be able to support uh, this project. We were very concerned, obviously, when we were unsuccessful in getting FTA funding uh, earlier, but uh, certainly uh, we're hopeful, and we'll certainly speak to... Uh, uh, Thelma Drake, who will be a key decision maker as it relates to this uh, in terms of the importance of this project. But certainly coming back to, uh, to that uh, operational question, we'll certainly evaluate that because we understand the congestion is, uh, at that location. Well, let me ask wait, wait, wait. Okay. Andy, I'm did you have Just, uh, and, and um, I don't know what the, uh, as I look at this, uh, the one issue that does strike, and I understand where Tommy's coming from, but when you do this just as a, as a, another issue involved in the planning and perhaps it's already been done uh, would have been discussion with the fire department uh, yes, sir. I take it it's, it's occurred and they yes, have sir. blessed this yes sir. Uh, we will do we'll need to do some minor signal modifications to keep buses from blocking their exit but we've already talked to them about that and that's included in the cost estimates okay real quick Barkley chip question yeah uh, <coughs> Obvious, I'm on the first side of this thing, but you're not going to have a crosswalk on St. Paul today? Uh, based on some feedback that we've received, we're, we're not planning to do that. Or signal. You're not going to, so you're going to take them down to Charlotte Street to get across? They, they would need to cross at Wood Street I mean, or possibly Street. down to Market Street. We'll have to find a way to so channel it. And they had to put a fence all the way across St. Paul, all the way down. That's, 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 that, that's a jailbreak through there? Yes, sir. And I guess. Are you going to vote for it? That's I'm, the case. I'm, I'm not, I, I think it's going to be fine, Paul. I don't think I don't agree with the location. I think it's too expensive. But, but how about <coughs> this thing serves? You know, I met. It serves with the region. The region. And I. And I, maybe this is a question. Why couldn't we get other cities in the region that are benefiting from this to participate in the cost of this? You know that, that that certainly is a challenge based on our current configuration of a cost allocation of plan where the city is really paid by service hours. But uh, that's why we feel that uh, the identification of these grant funds uh, is so important to trying to make this project. It seems like we bear the brunt. You know, we get two bucks on HRT and we're paying 40 plus percent. Now we make a capital improvement. We're hosting the headquarters building, I mean, we have given and given and given, and I don't, I don't, I mean, well, that's, that's another that's, day that's, for another issue. Well, that's because the General Assembly won't allow us to charge for being a host. Yeah, Anthony's next. Okay. Could right. someone, what is different about this transfer station than the transfer station that we had prior to building the Wells Fargo Center? 
Uh, Ray can comment on that. No, no, I'm talking about other than I'm talking about the, 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 the people. What changes as it relates to from a people? That's a good question. Um, when we were on Charlotte Street before the construction of the Wells Fargo building, there were fewer routes. There were only eight routes at that time. And the, the best thing about that, it was walking into downtown. You were right there. And it was a very visible stride, a sight. It was right across from Chrysler <coughs> Hall and Scope. So we didn't have those issues of remoteness and not viewable from the street. Also, since 2008, the system has grown. There's been new routes added into the system, such that the operations of Cedar Grove now supports 16 bus routes. Um, 17, one won't come down to 23, but 16 routes. So we've grown much more than the eight routes that used to be on Charlotte Street. But the good things about Charlotte Street is you could walk right into downtown to your final destination and it was a very visible location and perceived to be safe because it was in the heart of downtown. Okay, so you have 17 buses now. On the, well, you still, they still would come down and they would, at that point, would make that right come all the way back around. They would turn off St. Paul down on Charlotte. They were making that turn to come off St. Paul to come down Charlotte. At the old location? Right. They, the eight routes were doing most of that. They would right. come straight across Charlotte, lay over on Charlotte, and return up Monticello or return back into downtown, down St. Paul. So, okay. Because they, they go in two basic directions. I guess my last part is Barkley alluded that he was concerned about people crossing uh, not at the crosswalk, but crossing, you know, right there where they got off the bus. <coughs> My, I guess I thought about that and I said, okay, if we were successful in developing the, uh, the front of the St. Paul Quadrant, then not only will we have more cars on St. Paul, but we will have more people crossing the street. Uh, because again, the goal is to try to condense downtown and you know have it where it's pedestrian in front of where people will be walking. So if you're going to eventually have more people crossing anyway, what's the problem having it today? Well, I think right there though it's dangerous. If you're going to have development, if I, if I look at the St. Paul Quadrant development, okay, and I look at that 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 front part from uh, the Popeyes all the way up. They talk about uh, 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 mixed density, you know, uh, commercial, retail, residential, all incorporated in that area. Okay, so no matter what part of St. Paul you're on, you're going to have people crossing at the various areas. People are going to be crossing St. Paul. But they shouldn't be crossing in Sentiment Block. That's a very dangerous intersection to cross. Oh, well, and, I, I, I mean, I, I so understand they need that, to but you're going to have people cross. So I'm saying you're going to have the same problem stopped. tomorrow that we're talking about you're having today. But they need to be funneled to the streets no, to cross. I, 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 under, I understand right. that. But what I'm saying is that was one of the arguments. What okay. I'm saying, whether you, you, you just see it today, okay. yeah, whether you see it today or you see it tomorrow, right. to major, it's going to be an issue. A major transportation study when all that comes in. Right. Um, okay, two, two more questions because we got another thing on here. Andy, I, you I, do, I will say this, um, uh, and I have remarks prepared when we formally vote on this particular issue, but one thing that really bothers me is the Hampton Transfer Station. Um, if I remember, it's, un, it's unmanned, uh, and I know not a lot of buses go through, but a significant number go through, and it's Where? Hampton. It's right catty corner of the General District Court. Right. And the problem with, and, and I can tell you, I've been there, and it is not uh, kept up. Now, granted, it's shared with Greyhound, uh, but it is not kept up. It is not uh, uh, taken care of. And I know that we keep a supervisor at Cedar Grove because I've seen the vehicle. Uh, that being the case, I really would ask that you promise us that there will be somebody at the transfer station at St. Paul. Because you cannot, I mean, we're a city of 250,000, you know, 50, 60,000 people ride the buses every day, not just in Norfolk, but the entire system. You have a ferry coming to Norfolk, about 1,000 people every day. You have a light rail carrying about 5,000 every day. This is in three blocks of this. This, this cannot be an unmanned facility. Uh, if anything, it has to have 
uh, you need to, to do something about that because I will be, I'll have a big problem with it if it's unmanned. Uh, and I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, clearly we have said that we don't intend to repeat the mistakes of Cedar Grove at this particular location. I have requested uh, a stronger security plan at all of our bus locations. I really believe in terms of growing choice ridership, right. this addressing Cedar Grove is the single most significant barrier in terms of that goal. But, the, well, but I the do question agree this. And the manager, that's a yes, you can have somebody there? Yes. Okay, yes, thank you. Is. All right, um, wait a Thanks. minute, right here. Thank we'll go right here, Tommy. Um, we'll go. Cedar Grove, that becomes open basically now we have that property. I know you're limited to what can be done there, but can we get money back from that property by making it available now? Is there something that could be done with it? I mean, no, no, there's parts of it that you can't put buildings on. It could be a bus storage facility. It could be a tour bus place. I mean, there's lots of things that could be done there, but I'm just wondering, is it? Have we thought that through by now this property becoming available down the road to get money back um, for the cost of this? Sure, that's, that's something that should be part of it. Looking at what I know we're restricted. I know sure. there's issues there, but there are parts of it that can see some type of development. Anthony? I would just say that, you know, when I go across the city and I look at some of the areas where you guys have not replaced some of the built bus shelters, and that is critical to a lot of our citizens who depend on public transportation to get around. Right on Waterside Drive, you guys had to replace the built bus shelters. You got a lot of built bus shelters on major thoroughfares that have been removed and have not been replaced. You know, in the 21st century, we shouldn't have to rely on a bus sign or a pole, you know, for people to stand out un you know, in the element to catch the bus. And so if we're going to do this, I would hope that you guys would take the same approach and, 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 it's, and, it's, and the same, uh, uh, give us the, the, the same due diligence as you've given light rail. Because again, it's supposed to be choice. Yes. Uh, create alter alternative ways uh, uh, to get around our city. And if you're not going to improve our bus routes, I mean our bus, uh, bus stops, then we, we can't, and you have one area that's, you know, nice, that you're not going to have people ride. You know, we want to change the mindset of people, that people that are in their cars get out of their cars and start riding the bus. And so I just would ask, that, respectfully ask, that you guys, you know, take a real hard look at the inventory you got. Tommy's brought this up before about the trash can, for the maintenance and upkeep of that. If you can't do it, let's work in concert as a partnership. Let our folk handle it, but it should not be, you know, the way we ride about the trash cans overflowing, they're knocked over, you know, they bust, they go shelters, they got, they got graffiti on them, they got signs saying up. That shouldn't be. So I, I, I depend on you guys to be able to take care of those issues. So that's my suggestion. Thank you. I commit to bring a report back to the council. Okay. Thank you. Um, you want to make a comment about the light rail? I, I would like if Jeff can just come for two sure, seconds sure. to, Jeff, to Jeff, go through the uh, purpose of the resolution. Uh, you just many of you will remember We were here about a year ago talking about with light rail now open, what's the next step? Because we always knew that the starter alignment of 7.4 miles hoped to see grow and become a, a, a link throughout all the region and, and, and talked about that, uh, what would be the next steps. Unfortunately, at that time, FTA was saying, as Virginia Beach had already started their extension analysis, that they wanted to take a, about a 12-month look at what ridership was and help better calibrate the models. As a region that didn't have a big component of transit previously, our models weren't working real well, and therefore there, there was this um, effort to uh, get better information into the planning process. Virginia Beach, that, that, that period has passed. Virginia Beach is getting ready to go, and the proposed resolution that you have before you uh, on the agenda tonight 
supports the Virginia Beach effort going forward, and then also asks then let's it's time now to start looking at the options to go to uh, the naval base and, and start that alternative analysis work uh, so that those can proceed as the next logical extensions from the 7.4 miles. So I can get into more detail. It makes detail. sense for all of us, especially for those people who are coming from Virginia Beach who are trying to get to the naval base, which is a large uh, proportion of the folks who are going to the naval base. <coughs> I understand the HRT has money for that study, right? Have one point eight million here, Mark. It's been set aside for us to do this, and we're waiting for the twelve-month ridership report. So. Do we have an estimate yet uh, if this were to extend into Virginia Beach? What our share of the operational costs would be with this? Has this become a fifty-fifty split with Virginia Beach? I don't. Know. Um, the work of Virginia Beach is going to identify uh, how much the operational cost is based on their operating plan for Virginia Beach. The goal is to match the service hours that Norfolk is providing, but because the distance is greater, there's going to be a, a larger report. It's just like the Route 20 that you both pay. Um, it's based on the revenue miles, so you pay about 40% of the cost of the Route 20, and the City of Virginia Beach pays for balance. Um, if the City of Virginia Beach wants to run later in the evening, they're, they're going to have to pay for those extra hours. But that will come as an outcome of the study. We weren't there yet when it had stopped to recalibrate the model. That will be one of the prime deliverables that we study. Paul, oh, and, I, and I, I don't mean to, to, to pour water on this fire. I mean, I, I, I've been a, a big fan of HRT since I've come on council and, and riding the buses. And, uh, I don't, I personally don't like the timing of this. Uh, I think it, uh, and uh, I hate to say it, but it just doesn't, it doesn't appear appropriate as Virginia Beach is about to do their um, their vote. My preference would be is that we vote after their vote. We can uh, vote to do it, but I still my preference would be is is that let uh, I don't think that it should appear that we in any way would be uh, attempting to influence their vote, and the timing bothers me. Uh, that's all I and I, I really don't like the timing. I, I apologize. It really is new to me. Uh, I've focused most of my day on, on frankly, on the uh, bus transfer issue. Uh, and frankly, I tried to read and understand this. And I told Marcus, I, I tried to read and understand this, but this was, this was very difficult to understand, this, uh, these slides. Uh, it was language that was beyond me. So I, I, mean, I, I will say I, have a, I can't say I'm going to vote for it today, but it really is. I, I don't think it's right that it appears that we're attempting to influence another city's vote. On this particular issue, I think we come out of this cleaner if we wait until they vote. We get together with them. We look like we're moving forward together, and that really has been my issue with light rails, my understanding of it. And I really think it would be healthier if we did that, because right now I'm not comfortable. Well, I will tell you there are some folks in Virginia Beach who have urged us to move to have the vote now sooner rather than later, and um, that's one of the reasons that it's been brought on here. I mean, if you want to make a motion to continue it and folks want to vote for that. But I, I mean, it's here for a reason. We are trying to lend. There are people from Virginia Beach who will use that going to the nation. I, I know, and that's what I do. got to happen. I know, and I don't want to be a pawn in their particular election. I think it will be successful at the beach. Know. Well, I think we're being asked to do this is it, the timing bothers me. Um, my preference would be to, to table this, and, and I don't know if we have enough, uh, if other council members are, are in agreement, but that is my. I don't think I can, I, my, my gut tells me something about voting for this in advance of their vote bothers me at, at this 11th hour, and I understand we had to get the timing right for us, uh, but it does, uh, it does raise a significant concern for me, and I, 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 I have to tell, if, if we don't push it back, I, I will have a hard time voting yes, because I don't want it to appear the semblance of impropriety that we are attempting to influence some other city's vote. Uh, and, you know, you, I mean, you're certainly entitled yeah. to those feelings. Yeah. I, I don't think it, it casts any semblance of it. There's any semblance of it. Well, it looks right. like we're trying to That's the only thing. Well, I mean, you know, we tried for years to get Virginia Beach to come along with us in library. Well, I think it's easier for you to partnership with them once they vote this through. Well, that's what I'm that, saying. That, it appears that, it will pass. I have confidence it will pass in Virginia Beach. Uh, that being said, and, 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 and whatever their voters deem appropriate. It seems that the, the polls are showing that. Whatever their voters deem appropriate, I just don't want to be one influencing that. Yeah, but we don't want to 
Okay. Well, we would have liked to have done it early. You know, we, we should have done it 10 it, years ago. <laughs> we talked about it in the spring, but we wanted to wait until the ridership number. It's not like it just popped up. Okay. Well, resolution, yeah. yeah. If yeah, this was coal, y'all would delay it for two weeks. Three weeks. Three weeks. Three weeks. I asked for one a month ago. Yes. That's what we had found last time. Thank you.